Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me for this quick update on the newest gold COPD guidelines. As you may recall, in an effort to standardize care for patients with COPD, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and the World Health Organization introduced the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, or GOLD, guidelines in 2001. These guidelines are updated yearly and are evidence-based. The 2017 version included some significant changes. I would also like to alert you, if you have questions for me throughout, go ahead and um, enter those on the question side of your um, screen. So our objectives for this webinar include a very brief review of COPD, including the definition, prevalence, and risk factors, um, I'll briefly talk about assessment tests that you'll see mentioned in the guidelines, like the COPD assessment test and the Modified Medical Research Council Respiratory Questionnaire. I'll give you the guideline update, mainly focusing around the ABCD risk classification grading system, and then how to treat patients in each stage of that um, ABCD grading system. And I can also take questions. So as you probably remember from school, COPD is a persistent airflow limitation brought on by chronically inhaling noxious particles or gases. Most patients present with shortness of breath or a productive cough. Remember, patients should be evaluated for COPD if they have risk factors, any type of shortness of breath, chronic cough, or sputum production. The number one risk factor in the U.S. is smoking cigarettes. But in other parts of the world, inha inhaling biofuels and pollution are major factors. Other risk factors include a family history, low birth weight, childhood respiratory infections. The incidence and prevalence is probably higher than you would guess and varies significantly throughout the US. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or the CDC, the lowest prevalence in states ranges from three to about 4%. The prevalence in Missouri, however, and several other high prevalence states can range from 7 to 9 percent. The incidence and prevalence of COPD is expected to continue to rise as the population ages and people continue to smoke. Although COPD was the sixth leading cause of death in 1990, it's estimated that it will actually be the third leading cause of death worldwide by 2020. So the staging of COPD into mild through very severe has not changed. You may remember what stage a patient is characterized, char categorized into will be determined by their pulmonary function test. So their post bronchodilator FEV1 to FEC ratio will be less than 70. And then you look at the post bronchodilator FEV1. So just a reminder, if it's greater than 80, that's considered mild or stage one. 50 to 80 is moderate, stage two, 30 to 50, severe, stage three, and then less than 30 is very severe or stage four. The guidelines mention several tools for assessing the impact that COPD is having on a patient's life. The two most commonly used in practice and research are the COPD assessment test or the CAT score or the Modified Medical Research Council questionnaire, um, often seen as the MMRC. Both are brief questionnaires and are self-administered. Either one can be used when assessing a patient's risk stratification, which will be covered shortly. So GOLD continues to refine its ABCD grading system that they first introduced in 2011. The ABCD grading system considers both COPD symptoms along with exacerbation frequency and severity. And to remind you, A is better, D is worse. Before this update, spirometry was a component of the ABCD grading system. Probably the biggest change with the 2017 update is the separation of symptom evaluation from spirometry results. So separating spirometry from the ABCD risk stratification was done because it's been shown that airflow limitation or PFT results correlates less well with functional limitation and quality of life than patient reported symptoms and exacerbation history. Spirometry is still the gold standard for diagnosis and should be performed in patients. So moving from the left-hand side of this slide, we see that spirometry confirms a COPD diagnosis and an assessment of airflow limitation is made. Same as always, patients are then categorized as either gold one through four, so mild through very severe, based on those PFT results. Now, separate from that, we, will, we still want to assess a patient's based on their symptoms, risk for future exacerbations, and the effect the disease has on their overall health. 
when we do that by categorizing them into a risk grade of A, B, C, or D. So I think a patient example might actually help here. So we've got Bob, a 58-year-old male with COPD, complaining of a chronic productive cough. He's been smoking a pack a day since he was 18 and is sent for pulmonary function tests. You can see his results on the slide. So Bob, in fact, does have COPD based on this FEV1 to FEC ratio that remains less than 70 after bronchodilators. And we would actually assess him as gold stage two moderate because his post FEV1, his post bronchodilator FEV1 is between 50 and 80% predicted. Now let's assess his risk stratification score. So Bob tells us he's had one exacerbation in the past year, treated as an outpatient with an oral steroid burst and a round of oral antibiotics. His CAT score today is nine. Therefore, he would, call, he would fall into risk category A. If he had worse symptoms, so a CAT score greater than 10 or more exacerbations, this could have pushed him into a different category. So why are the ABCD risk stratification levels necessary? Why did the guidelines put so much emphasis on this now? The guidelines recommend medications for treating patients based on where they fall in this ABCD grading scheme. When treating patients, the emphasis should be placed on meds that can help improve symptoms but also prevent future exacerbations. So this is an overview of guideline recommended treatments for patients in each category, and we're going to go through each one of these separately. Before I do that, I just briefly wanted to mention and make sure that we're all on the same page regarding terminology and terms or abbreviations that I use. So a SABA is a short-acting beta agonist. A LABA is a long-acting beta agonist, like a salmeterol or formoterol. A SAMA is a short-acting muscarinic antagonist, like ipatropium. A LAMA is a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. An example of that would be teotropium. ICS stands for inhaled corticosteroids, so like your fluticasone, beclomethasone, budesonide. ICS lava, those are your inhaled corticosteroid long-acting beta agonist combos, so like Advair. Uh, ICS lama is an inhaled corticosteroid long-acting muscarinic antagonist, and then a lava lama is your long-acting beta agonist long-acting muscarinic antagonist. So starting with group A, remember our patient Bob was group A. Um, they, these patients can be appropriately treated um, with a bronchodilator. That could actually be a SABA or a LABA. Group B patients, um, when you've got patients that fall into group B, initially they should be placed on a long-acting bronchodilator. There's really no evidence to, to recommend one class of long-acting bronchodilator over another for that initial release, relief of symptoms. In the individual patient, the choice should depend on the patient's perception of symptom relief. So our options here are gonna include LABAs, so salmuterol, formoterol, um, the NEBD versions of formoterol, olodotorol would be options, or you could do a LAMA, so teotropium, aclodinium, eumeclodinium, or glycopyrrolate. Now, if patients in group B remain symptomatic on one drug, you want to add a drug from another class for dual drug therapy. For patients with severe breathlessness, initial therapy with two bronchodilators can be considered. If the addition of a second bronchodilator does not improve symptoms, the guidelines are actually now recommending that you revert back to monotherapy only. So this is really the first time the gold guidelines really talk about de-escalation of therapy or stepping down if symptomatic improvement isn't reached. So to remind you, patients in group C or D, these are gonna be our patients with more frequent exacerbations and worse symptom scores, which leads to poor overall quality of life. So for our patients that fall into group C, guidelines recommend starting with a single long-acting bronchodilator, and they're actually going as far as to recommend LAMAs. And so remember, our LAMA options are going to consist of that teotropium, aclodidium, eumeclodidium, or glycopyrrolate. And they, they recommend starting with LAMAs because in two large head-to-head -head comparisons, the tested LAMA was better than the LABA to, when preventing exacerbations. Now, if patients have persistent exacerbations, they can benefit from adding a second long-acting bronchodilator, so you would go to that LABA-LAMA combo. Or you could use a combo of the long-acting beta agonist and an inhaled steroid, so that would be your LABA-ICS. 
Now, remember, ICS can increase the risk for developing pneumonia in some patients, and so the guidelines recommend as their primary choice the lava llama combo. And remember, our available, we do have some lava llama combo available in the same um, device. So teotropium combined with olodanterol, and that's the Stialto Respimat. Another option is eumeclidinium and volantrol, that's the Enoro Ellipta. Glycopyrrolate and indicotrol are the Udibron Neohaler, and then glycopyrrolate for motorol, which is the new Bevesby Aerosphere. So our group D patients are probably the hardest to treat, right? These are going to be our patients with severe symptoms that impacts their overall quality of life and their overall health, but they're also experiencing frequent COPD exacerbations. So preventing future exacerbations has really been an outcome of research for COPD drugs for, for a long time. And keeping patients out of the hospital, you know, not only reduces costs, but also impacts the patient's overall morbidity and mortality. For group, B, group D patients, guidelines recommend a lava llama combo as the place to start. It's been shown in studies that with patient reported outcomes as the primary endpoint that lava llama combos showed superior results compared to using the single substances. So if a single bronchodilator is chosen as initial therapy, again, the guidelines are going to recommend going with a llama over a la lava because they prevent exacerbations better. Also, lava llama combo was superior to lava ICS combo in preventing exacerbations and other patient reported outcomes in this group D patient population. Also, to add a little bit more fuel to this fire, group D patients are actually going to be at higher risk of developing pneumonia when receiving treatment with an ICS. So in some patients, initial therapy with a lava ICS may be the first choice. These patients may have a history and possibly other findings suggestive of the asthma COPD overlap syndrome. And this asthma COPD overlap syndrome is also covered in the 2017 guidelines update, but unfortunately we don't have time today to review that particular topic. High blood eosinophil counts may also be considered as a parameter to support the use of ICS in these patients, although this is still currently under debate. So in patients who develop further exacerbations on lava llama therapy, the guidelines give us two alternative choices. The first is you can escalate to a lava llama ICS. And so studies are currently underway comparing the effects of dual therapy versus triple therapy. So we're trying to figure out which is better, lava llama or lava llama ICS in preventing exacerbations. Or the second choice is to switch to lava ICS. Now, I do want to point out there's really no evidence to support switching from lava. There's no evidence that says if you switch from lava llama to lava ICS, you're going to have better COPD exacerbation prevention. Also, if that lava ICS therapy is, is patients are still having exacerbations, you would still consider adding a llama later. Also, as a reminder, um, available ICS lava llama combos are not currently FDA approved. However, there are two in the pipeline. They include the first is budesonide, formoterol, and glycopyronium, and that'll probably be in an HFA device. And the second is fluticasone furoate with volantrol and eumeclidinium, and that will be in the ellipta device. I anticipate that they will both have once daily dosing, which is kind of nice, a three drug combo with once a day, um, with once a day dosing. So if patients treated with that lava llama ICS still have exacerbations, the following options can be considered. That's when we could potentially add roflumilast. So this may be considered in patients if they have an FEV1 less than 50% predicted, chronic bronchitis, and it, particularly if they've had an, at least one hospitalization for an exacerbation in the last year. The other choice is you could, you could potentially add a macrolide. The best available evidence here is going to be for the use of azithromycin. I personally haven't seen this done, but you know, make sure patient providers are aware that they need to consider the possibility of resistance if they go this route. The other option would be to get rid of the ICS. So, you know, if it's not helping, they've got an increased risk of adverse effects, especially pneumonia, and you know, there's really no harm in taking an ICS away. Um, so, you know, that could also help support that recommendation. So, let's briefly look at a patient example. So we've got um, a patient newly diagnosed that falls into category C. 
So remember, those are going to be patients that have worsening symptoms, frequent exacerbations, and remember, remember, preventing exacerbations in this population is key. And so, you know, guidelines recommend starting with a llama. Our choices would be the teotropium, eumeclidinium, aclidinium, or glycopyrrolate. If patients have still further exacerbations on a llama monotherapy, that's when we would switch to a dual drug combo lava llama. So the take home point here really is that this is different from previous editions of the guidelines. We used to push ICS LAVAs to prevent exacerbations. The push now is to get folks on LAMA agents. Again, they're gonna have better exacerbation prevention data and less pneumonia risk with use. Also de-escalation of therapy. If patients don't respond or exacerbation frequency doesn't improve, remove that newly added agent. No benefit, plus if it's not cost effective and it may be adding to inhaler burden, these are all justifications for getting rid of um, that second agent. I do just want to at least mention that this guideline update definitely reflects the vast improvements in COPD therapies that are now available. When I went to school, there were probably only a handful of meds for COPD. I remember albuterol, ipitropium, and there might even have been a lava. I'm not sure. This update is also reflective of the latest evidence from multiple large randomized controlled clinical trials, which is great because all pharmacists love evidence-based medicine. However, some of these newer agents, for example, combination inhalers and the newer devices don't come without cost. Of course, a once daily drug and combining drugs from different classes into one inhaler can improve adherence and outcomes, but only if the patient can use it correctly and afford it. The best inhaler is the one that patients can understand, can afford, and will use regularly. I did want to briefly mention monitoring of our COPD patients because I see a role for pharmacists here. In order to appropriately decide whether to adjust therapy, it should be determined if patients are adherent to their meds, using their inhaler correctly, and experiencing adverse effects, among other things. Educating patients on the importance of adherence and why it's important to take medications can be done when dispensing refills. The guidelines actually now state that inhaler technique should be demonstrated to all patients and their technique confirmed before deeming a medication is not effective. So who better to do that than us, the medication experts? Documenting if a patient is experiencing an adverse effect also falls into pharmacist expertise. So what can we as pharmacists do? You know, really get out there and talk to patients about non-farm therapy. Help them understand the importance of quitting smoking and linking, you know, continued smoking with worsening pulmonary function. Making sure patients are up to date on their immunizations and then really hitting device technique, you know, at first fill, subsequent fills, and using that show me and teach back method to really be able to assess if patients are using their inhalers correctly. And then also encouraging close follow-ups with their providers. I hope you enjoyed this brief guideline update. To summarize, major changes include separating pulmonary function test results out of the mix when assessing patients into that ABCD grading system. There are changes in treatment recommendations now based on those ABCD grading system. An emphasis on preventing exacerbations. Remember, you got better evidence with llamas versus lavas. ICS therapy can increase pneumonia rates, especially in our sicker patients. So for example, those that fall into category D is in dog. De-escalation of therapy is warranted if no symptomatic improvement or the frequency of, of exacerbation rate is not improved. Again, this is the first time the guidelines really talk about um, stepping down or getting rid of medications. And then also patients in group C and D, I do want to at least say that, you know, those recommendations are probably likely to continue to change in the future as more and more of these large um, clinical trial data um, becomes available. And lastly, regular attempts should be made to assess patients' device technique. With that, I will entertain any questions that anyone has. So I don't see any. Um, I don't see any questions, so I think that concludes our broadcast. Thanks.